Scott Robertson's Music Biz Marketing Strategies. Now, here's your host, Scott Robertson. Hey, happy Friday, everybody. You are tuned to May the Best Brand Win on Intertalk Media, the undisputed leader in Music Biz Talk. I am Scott, your host, and a man who is coming at you from a state with a $270 billion budget deficit and the second most psychopaths in the union. By the way, if you were asking who number one is in that category, that would be Washington, D.C. They have uh, a new study came out this week that the most psychopaths live in the state of California and also in Washington, D.C. And adding to that count of crazy people is my partner in podcasting down at Intertalk Central, Paul B. How's it going, Paul? I think they count me as like 25 of those psychopaths at least. (laughs) I'm skewing, then, I love skewing the curve. The article, if, if you if you check out the the, the study, uh, which came out, I think it was a University of Texas uh, study, and it came out and said, you know, California has the the second most amount of psychopaths uh, in the nation. They actually define, you know, what a psychopath is, and it's not like you know Jason Voorhees from Halloween, you know, showing up with a big knife or whatever. It's actually people who uh, have really limited conscience, and so they engage in a lot of anti-social behavior, but they seem perfectly normal on the surface, but they engage in all kinds of crazy ass anti-sexual or anti-sexual, anti-social behavior, um, you know, and so uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. So it's like all these people who seem normal, but yet we have the second most, uh, the, the highest uh, psychopath count in the union besides D.C. Now, see, D.C., I can see that, right? Yeah. At, that town, that town would drive you to, the, to that that side of things. I can yeah, see it. I can see that too. But California, what do you what do you think is responsible for that? I don't know. I think just I, I think it's just a big state. A lot of people flock here, and yeah, a lot just of a, desperados a greater... coming out of here. I guess that's right. We got a lot of desperados, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's get into it. Uh, so, uh, I am with a company called Robertson Communications, which I own and run, and um, we do uh, strategic public relations, marketing, and branding for um, for music products uh, companies, for uh, for technology companies, for nonprofits, uh, you know, really for any business that wants to have a more interesting take on its marketing and, and a more ethical take on its marketing. Um, we tend to color really inside the lines and, and um, all the things that I preach about on this show, um, we practice. Uh, so it's really important. If you want to reach me, here's how you do it. Uh, email at, so Scott at Robertson.com, two M's like communication.com or on the website, Robertson.com, two M's.com or social um, at, at Robertson.com uh, on Twitter and then Facebook.com slash Robertson.com. And uh, anyway, you get the idea. We're at Robertson.com. That's where we are. So you are tuned in to May the Best Brand Win on, and on Intertalk Media. And this is episode 90 which I like to call uh, shaping public opinion. So, you know, how do we feel about an issue? You know, a question that is asked and answered countless times per day, and it's really influenced by every news cycle, every story, every post, every video we have going out there. And if you're going to be any good at public relations, uh, which is really all about influence, then you really have to understand public opinion, how it's formed, why it's formed, and there's a great deal of science to um, that answering that question and quite a bit of art and luck to it as well. So we're going to have a nice whirlwind episode discussion of public, uh, public opinion today here on May the Best Brand Win. We're going to delve deep into it. We're also going to come back and talk about who's winning and losing. And then I'm going to leave you with some tips on how you uh, can effectively influence public opinion, which is going to make you feel super powerful going into the weekend. You'll be like, I am a supervillain and I can now shape public opinion. So, so what is it? You know, let's, let's go into it right away. So basically, public opinion defined as the desires, wants, and thinking of the majority of the people or the collective opinion of the people of a society or state on an issue or problem is called public opinion. The term actually dates back to the 17th century uh, from uh, an essay by uh, John Locke called An Essay Concerning Human Understanding. That is a page turner. You're going to want to bring that to your next bathroom visit, I guarantee you. And that contains um, an early, con- you know, an early consideration of the importance of public opinion 
and usually around the idea of politics, right? But just so you know, in the term, in the, you know, public opinion does center around politics, but in the, in the field of public relations, um, it can really mean a lot of different things. It can be issues. It can be reputations. It can be, um, you know, Jurassic Park fallen kingdoms coming out. This, this, there will, there will be public opinion about, um, you know, does that live up to it? You know, should, should that be counted among the official Jurassic Park movies? I mean, there's public opinion on should the Avengers, you know, have, should different Avengers have lived at the end of, um, you know, Infinity War? I mean, there's public opinion about bands. There's, you know, Beatles versus Stones. There's public opinion about everything. Um, and as a management function, you know, PR encompasses, you know, quite a bit of this. So, we try to anticipate, analyze, and interpret public opinion attitudes that might impact the good or ill, the operations and plans of an organization. So what that means, and stated in sort of the old English terminology there, but what that means for us people here on today's earth, that means if we're trying to influence things, if we are trying to um, make a, you know, change minds and and persuade people, which in essence is what you're trying to do with public relations, even if the beginning of the cycle is you're just trying to make people aware of something so that ultimately you can, you know, change their mind and change their perception, um, then you must know what it is and and you must know what it is and what it's not. You know, how, and, and, you know, how it's formed is really, really important. So as you might imagine, and I know you can feel there's a list coming, there are seven stages of public opinion. The process evolves um, in seven distinct stages, according to um, Daniel uh, Yankovic, uh, an author and public opinion analyst. Um, so basically, um, I'm just going to go through the stages really quick for you so that we kind of understand that it's, uh, it's sort of a, a cycle that, uh, that you can watch on almost any issue, even the stupid Avenger thing that I told you about. So stage one is dawning awareness. That's you're becoming aware of an issue, but you don't really feel a, a need to take action. Then there, stage two is a greater urgency. Now, in stage two, we're moving beyond awareness to a sense of urgency. The dominant sentiment is, you know, okay, we're, now we need to do something. You know, um, stage three, we're reaching for solutions. The public begins to look for alternatives for dealing with issues, you know, uh, which kind of converts your flea fro- floating concern into like more specific calls uh, to action. Really, really important. Stage four is what they call wishful thinking. This is where the public's resistance to facing trade-offs is the most manifest, and people assume they can kind of have it all. Um, you know, and we can walk through uh, an issue and kind of, uh, you know, we should walk through the, uh, the issue that just bubbled to the public opinion this, this week with um, immigrant children. And what and Donald Trump. This isn't a political show, but just to kind of show you public opinion in action, you can really see it work in like a week's time. <laughs> it's uh, you know on that issue. Stage five is weighing the choices. In this stage, the public does the choice work. They kind of weigh the pros and cons of the alternatives of dealing with the issue, that kind of thing. Stage six, we take a stand intellectually, you know, and stage seven, we make a responsible judgment morally and emotionally. <laughs> That's kind of funny. So um, those are your those are really your uh, your stages. So let's um, so, you know, let's walk through the the issue the the, the uh, probably the biggest public issue this week was um, the fact that, uh, you know, uh, Im- uh, uh, children of immigrants, uh, illegal immigrants, illegal aliens were being separated from their um, their families. And it became um, an issue in just in just a, f- a few days' time. It really it really bubbled up, you know, pretty quickly. And don't forget, you know, um, the, the speed really plays a role here in terms of your response, in terms of of, of everything. So, like back in the day, you know, uh, people just weren't aware of what was going on in other parts of the country. If they wanted to become aware of it, they had to really wait until somebody told them, and then. You know, usually it wasn't done in any kind of mass sense, so it was was it was really hard to get a feeling for who else felt the same way you did. That kind of thing. It's you know, and and um, so it was. Uh, I don't know. In some cases, I guess it was probably easier to communicate in those days because you had more time. You know, um, but you certainly didn't have any sort of feedback mechanism of you know to to people 
to let you know kind of how they feel about an issue either. So, you know, plus and minus. So stage one, dawning awareness. So uh, earlier this week, um, the, the uh, U.S. Border Patrol, you know, re- started releasing footage of, uh, you know, these immigrant children, you know, being, you know, basically being processed and being separated from their parents. Then, so the the footage, you know, started to circulate. The news media started to pick it up. We very quickly moved from stage one, like Monday, and like by 10 a.m. Pacific time on Monday, we were already in stage two, where people, where there was a great sense of urgency. We must do something. This is wrong. You know, we 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 must we must act. We must act. Then people, um, you know, and this obviously fuels every political talk show in the country then people were reaching for solutions oh solutions 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 everywhere solutions i everybody's got ideas right then in stage four we saw the um the trade-offs wishful thinking you know we saw people saying well yeah this this choice doesn't really work because you know then we you know everything from choices of but we should instantly make you know these these children citizens of the united states of america and then you're like, well, but then, then all the people who stood in line and became the citizens of the country the right way, uh, it's, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like being at a fraternity party and, and everybody has to pay five bucks for the keg. And then somebody walks up and they say, ah, you can drink, you know, you're cool. Everybody's pissed off at you, right? Everybody's pissed off at whoever made that decision because, you know, it, it really taps into hard our sense of fairness, um, you know, and anybody who's ever ex- experienced that. You may love the person, you know, like your brother with, with total compassion, but you're like, but you need to pony up the five bucks too. Cause I did and everybody else did in line and you don't, and you know, it's, it's, it's a, I don't know. It's a, it's, it's just something that really, um, goes against our, you know, human trade-off kind of engine stage five, weighing the choices. You saw a lot of weigh-in choices going on. Uh, you, you saw, you saw us move very quickly ripping through these last two segments until the president had to sign an executive order to really just get everybody to shut up about it. I mean, I mean, you know, you know tr- the truth, the truth of the matter is, is that he was tired of dealing with it and, uh, and just said, look, I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to pass immigration reform here. You guys are caught in this issue, which has been the issue by the way, uh, ever since you have laws and you have a, a working border and it's an issue that they have in Switzerland too. You know, it's, it, it is the issue of running a country and having borders and, you know, which I think people forget people, people are just kind of like, well, United States is the only one with immigration problems. It's like, have, this is where traveling outside the United States will help you a great deal when you, you, cause, because then you get an understanding that of, you know, lots of people want to go to lots of different countries for lots of different reasons. But if you're a citizen of one country, you don't get to. You know, you, you don't get to, you know, it's not, it's not a thing where, where there, there are rules, you know, in place. You don't just get to because you want to, and because you can walk across the border in many, um, you know, countries, uh, they'll, you know, they'll just shuttle you right back across the border, you know, unless you can prove, Hey, I need to be there for, I mean, one time I went to Canada, you know, I, I went to Canada and I was doing some consulting work and I got frisked down like I was a, you know, Los Angeles based drug dealer. You know, I mean, I, I showed up there and I had to answer questions in a room for like two, three hours, you know, because I said, and by the way, this is just a little learning lesson for all y'all out there. Never say you're a consultant. If you're going to Canada, uh, they hate, they hate the fact that you're an American and you are, might be taking jobs from Canadian consultants. And, uh, you, you, again, that's the kind of thing you learn at the border. Right. So, um, you know, where was I going with that? I, basically, I was saying that we moved very quickly through the last few stages, and you can kind of see it in that issue. And then we got to almost to a solution and sort of a, I, I mean, I guess a resolution on the issue in a very short period of time. Instead of this being a long term, lengthy debate, I mean, this thing hit Monday morning and it was solved with an executive action by Wednesday. <laughs> I mean, I mean, this thing was was done, you know, in, um, in just a, a matter of hours. And, you know, that's something that you need to know as a communicator. It's really, really important because this stuff can't, um, we don't have the the time to go have a, a, a lengthy leadership retreat about a lot of issues and discuss how we feel about them. Sometimes we have to move and we have to move now, you know, and, and sometimes that's not even fast enough. 
So um, anyway, it's really important in understanding um, public opinion when you kind of see the example like that. So, you know, public, uh, it, it really, it matters. Public opinion matters to marketing. And I've had this conversation with, with folks all the time, you know, uh, because people will think that, you know, public opinion, again, is like um, the immigration issue or it has to do, you know, with with like major political issues. And it certainly does. And there's certainly people like that. But there are pu- there's public opinion everywhere, 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 everywhere. And by the way, um, remember, the definition was the majority of the people. Well, you define the people as um, what as the plural of public. So publics, you know. And that sounds a little confusing, but in public relations, that's sort of what it means, right? Um, and you can also interchange the term audiences or publics. If if publics is, um, you know, freaking you out because you're not used to hearing that word in a plural, that's fine because, you know, audiences is another good way to say it. But let's say audiences opinion. I guess maybe that doesn't sound quite as, um, you know, I don't know, respected or exciting or whatever to say audience's opinion, but from you sitting in at your desk, you know, from a marketing perspective, this is about audience opinion and it can range from a lot of stuff. You know, it could, it could, your audience may have an opinion, depending on what your audience is, it is critically important for us always to be listening. You know, I, I talk about the importance of listening all the time and this is why, because if you don't understand your audience, audiences, majority opinion, majority public opinion on issues, you're not going to be very effective in connecting with them to make relationships. Or let's say that your job in communications is we need to help people feel differently about this issue, or we need to show them another side of this issue, uh, that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> but if you don't know what you're getting, what you're getting into, you know, you could be in a lot of trouble, you know, uh, I saw that when we worked at NAM, we talked about the um, issue of should we have a public day at the trade show? And, you know, you can do research and I'll tell you how it's going to come back. About 50 percent of the exhibitors are going to say yes and about 50 percent are going to say no. You know, so it's, but it's really important that you know who says yes and who says no on a given issue. If you find yourself with the job of trying to uh, to deal with that. That's the importance of public opinion, and a little, there's a little primer on that. Come on back. We're going to talk about who's winning and who's losing this week. Talk to you later. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Groove. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al DiMiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com. Ready to get your groove on? I'm Tim Dolbear, the host of Sound Experience on Intertalk Radio. Each week, I talk with top professional audio engineers, producers, musicians, and the manufacturers that make the tools that we use in the studio each and every day. From capturing the perfect take to mastering your final release and the tools and how the pros use them, we are going to dive deep into their process and learn from their experience. I look forward to you joining us each week on Sound Experience with me, your host, Tim Dolbear. Make this your vinyl night. I'm John J.R. Robinson, and every week, music creation comes alive through stories, experiences, and sounds when vinyl records filled our hearts and minds. My friends and I share our tips and techniques used in creation of iconic tracks for recording artists such as Michael Jackson, Eric Clapton, Quincy Jones, and Steve Winwood, to name a few. Vinyl has emerged hot, and the soul of vinyl defines art and passion, which burns deepest at night. Tune in every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on entertalkradio.com.
May the best brand win with Scott Robertson's Music Biz Marketing Strategies. Now, here's your host, Scott Robertson. Hey, hey, everybody. You are smart because you are tuned to May the Best Brand Win on Intertalk Media, the undisputed leader in music biz talk. I am Scott, your host. We're talking about public opinion on the show today. Paul B., how's it going? Good, good. What do you think about public opinion? Uh, <laughs> I don't know what to think about it. It used to be that <laughs> that the only, your opinions were dictated to through like a couple of media channels, and now with social media, everyone's got an op- opinion. But it's still, I don't know, it tends to kind of aggregate into a lot of like – noise yeah. and squawking and nobody fact checks anything and the and the way the, the way misinformation s- spreads through it is uh it's crazy i i try to stay away from facebook i i think the, the you know the whole trump immigration thing the the one thing that tickled me i don't know if you were going to cover this anyway so sorry if i'm stepping in your topic but uh the the photos i think john favreau released those of uh you know children locked up in cages and everyone you know uh, became outraged and then later turned out those were from like 2014 under Obama. (laughs) (laughs) I know. I know people like to pretend that like, um, you know, that we're not running a country here, you know, that we don't have, it's like, it's like the operations of the United States of America continues, whether it's on your radar or not. And, um, you know, and, and I think it's really important to understand. It's like, you, you know, it's not always, uh, super pretty, Uh, Because there's lots of people that want to kind of force their way into your country and you're like, uh, no, got to have a thing on that, you know? Mm -hmm. And like I said, I always tell people, I say, uh, you should try to immigrate illegally to a country that's not the United States. They're not, they're not going to be nice about it. (laughs) They're they're really not. I mean, very few people are super nice about it because they're, you know, I don't know, they're protect, they're supposed to do a certain job. So I don't know. I, I guess I give people a little bit more of a pass on that, but, uh, it was kind of interesting, interesting, uh, interesting how fast the cycle was too, as I was saying in the first segment there, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, I mean, I was also impressed, like, I, you know, with, with Trump, I'm super confused. Some things about him are just obviously like re- really whacked out. And then on the other hand, I think a lot of the anti-Trump thing is hysteria. So I don't quite know what to think of the guy most of the time, Yeah, but, but yeah. the fact that there was, this out you know uh, public outrage and rather than doubling down and uh you know the president actually and you know and people are criticizing the the way it's been done may- maybe but the that he actually responded to public opinion by doing something yeah. is yeah. you know tr- tr- you know try that with like uh, you know the outrage against people being locked uh locked up for uh, you know, nonviolent drug offenses for the past forty years. Like, what? You yeah. know, most presidents are like tough. Too bad. This, this is this is the law. I don't care what you think. So the fact that a president actually responded to a public outrage on an issue is kind of kind of new and quickly. And quickly. I mean, really. I mean, like I said, it 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 ended. You know, the it ended the news cycle on that story uh, very quickly. And that's that's of course why he did it. You know, was just just okay. Let's move on. <laughs> let's move on. Here we go. And so, you know, interesting. Well, should we let's talk about who's winning and losing? Sure. Uh, y- you know, this week, uh, you know, WhatsApp, uh, which is an app where you find out WhatsApp. There you go. Uh, really, it's really winning and t- winning over uh, the young people, the youngsters. You know especially in, in terms of how they get their news. And this is going mean, to be really important for you as a marketer. So, you know, Facebook, the world's largest social network for news, um, the usage of Facebook is down nine percentage points from two, uh, from 2017 and down 20 percentage points for younger audiences, according to Reuters. So, but WhatsApp is up. So we continue, here's what they said. They continue to see a rise of the use of messaging apps for news as consumers are looking for more private and less confrontational spaces to communicate. That's really interesting, isn't it? And, uh, you know, uh, WhatsApp is, uh, was founded in, in 2009. It was bought in by Facebook in 2014, which a lot of people don't know for 19 billion in, in, uh, cash and stock. And 
it is more popular than Twitter in importance for news in many countries. Now, it you know, obviously, um, a lot of people don't know this, but, you know, so Facebook, you know, they, they own WhatsApp, they own Instagram, right? Of course, they own Facebook, you know, so... When, we, when you when you talk about this, it's really just more. Uh, I mean, Facebook's still doing fine because there, are, whichever whichever division wins, they win. But fewer than half of the people surveyed across the world said they trusted the media most of the time. And in the United States, it was thirty and thirty four percent said they trusted most news, um, and that was down four points. Right. So these these are numbers that. Uh, you know, obviously public relations is looking at closely because, you know, is it just political news? Are they okay with product news? That kind of stuff. So it's stuff that we talk about in the show uh, quite a bit, but it's, uh, I bring it up because I think, I think WhatsApp is winning, you know, and I I guess technically Facebook is uh, still winning because they own it, but uh, something to continuously monitor and, uh, and kind of keep on your radar. You know, um, the diaper business is in trouble for a very interesting reason. America's birth rate is at its lowest level in three decades. And uh, that's a problem for Pampers and Huggies. Birth rates began dropping in, in 2008 as the economy sank into a recession. Better access to contraceptives and younger Americans having children later in their lives have extended the decline, said the National Center uh, for Health Statistics. But the downturn has caused disposable diaper and training pants sales to fall 6%, according to Nielsen's most recent brick-and-mortar retail scanner. So they call it the diaper slump, and that will be the new normal for the foreseeable future. Isn't that fascinating? First of all, I didn't realize that we were having fewer babies. And second of all, I did not uh, realize that the diaper industry was so affected. So I guess we're going to say the that this is the the new normal for this industry and certainly that industry is losing uh right now they're going to have to find new and exciting ways to sell other products i guess or raise the prices or you know they'll they'll figure something out there's big brands behind those pro- those uh um those type of products big uh, consumer empires behind them shall we talk about instagram for a second so instagram uh launched uh igtv this week they have hit 1 billion users, which is um, exciting for them. And we say winning, right? Because now they're standing at 1 billion users. You feel like you have to do like the Dr. Evil from the 90s thing. You know, 1 billion users now look at the Instagram. But um, the new, this new platform, which is really interesting and all you marketers need to know about this, is a new long-form video platform, uh, you know, which is going to give markers another, another way to reach vast audience. So basically, um, it's going to be available as a standalone app and within Instagram. It's going to make Instagram a more direct competitor with things like, I don't know, YouTube and, um, you know, also, you know, TV news, things like that. And it gives uh, Facebook, you know, their parent company, a fresh channel for advertisers. Uh, And Instagram already accounts for a growing portion of Facebook's mobile ad revenue. Now, here is the rub, right? One of the reasons that a lot of people who check out Instagram like Instagram and not Facebook is what would they tell you if they, if, if you ask that question? Right, no marketing, right? There's not as much advertising. There's not as many sleazy people hanging around going, hey, kid, want to buy this? Hey, kid, what do you think about this? Hey, what do you think? Hey, man, hey, look right here. What do you think? Look what I got. Look what I got. It's really cool. You know, it's it's like it's like it's really important that you uh, that you know that kind of stuff, you know, that you know that, if the reason they are successful is because they are they don't have marketing, and now you're seeing a, a, a press release where they say we launched IGTV and now we can advertise to more people more. Now, um, a year from now on this show, what will the headline be? Kids, ba- people bailing on Instagram, and, and they found a new platform called blah blah blah, and the blah 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 um, network uh, promises no marketing. Do you see the theme? Do you, do you see the do you see the theme the way that I see it? To me, and I'll use my pool analogy, which is now famous. It's like um, if there's a pool party and there's a bunch of hip kids hanging out, they're having a good time. Everybody's splashing, having a great time. Marketing shows up, and their goal is okay. 
we want to reach these people, but they kind of do the equivalent of like showing up and urinating in the pool so no one can use it. Right. And then everybody goes, Ooh, I'm out of here. Well, forget this. You know, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting out of here. You know? So it's like, you know, marketing kind of is the problem, right? Sometimes we are the the problem. And then we say, well, nobody comes, nobody comes to that channel. Nobody comes to Facebook anymore because of, you know, because, you know, everybody's bailed on Facebook. It's like they bailed on Facebook because of you, you know, you are the reason, you know, and, and just kind of, you know, heads up for the, the new long form video. If you make this all about advertising to people, and interrupting them from what they want to do on your network, they will leave that too. And they'll go to the next platform and the next platform. They will find a pool that doesn't have urine in it. You know, they will find it. You know, they're resourceful like that. So, and what I typically kind of say to the industry on things like that is, can't we just figure that out and real and figure out some way that we can, that we can not be that? I mean, how, how do we, you know, how do we not be, be that thing that drives everybody away? Good God. So anyway, that's my two cents anyway. But I'm going to, uh, to conclude on this one, I'm going to Instagram reaching a billion users. That's winning. IGTV, certainly winning long form video. If you're a marketer and you're looking to do more stuff on Instagram, start investigating their IGTV, um, you know, platform here and, and see what you can do. Um, Instagram's betting that people are going to want longer vertical videos. I guess that's a, you know, a big deal. So, anywho, you know who's losing this week is the CEO of Audi, and the, really the this, because of the Volkswagen thing. So, Audi chief um, Rupert Stadler was arrested on Monday. Uh, parent company Volkswagen said, and um, I've covered this one before, uh, for, for, but not maybe not on the show. But um, so Volkswagen lied considerably and had like a deep, deep culture of lying. That's kind of reminiscent of of like our Wells Fargo situation that we recently had here. Um, And they lied about diesel mileage. And I mean, and when I say they lied, they didn't just like show up and lie like once they, they built in, they completely knew the truth, completely hit it and lied their asses off for a long time about this. Right. So CEO was fired. And then, um, I mean, I mean, obviously, if you're if you're getting arrested, you know, and there and there's going to be a hearing of, uh, about you, you know, for the for the CEO or whatever. I mean, that's that's significant, right? And it's all deals. It all dates back to this uh, this whole diesel, um, this whole diesel thing, you know, and just how much they misrepresented their mileage, you know, of uh, of their vehicles. And so, losing, losing, and nothing but losing going on there. Unilever, um, you know, Dove and all those fun brands, they're going to stop working with digital media influencers who buy followers. This is important. So um, Unilever is basically going to answer the call for transparency and all aspects of marketing. And they are going to, they're no longer going to work with social media influencers who buy followers. Very, very important to know that. Um, what, um, uh, office officer, chief marketing marketing officer Keith Weed called at best it's misleading, at worst it's corrupt. For the sake of a few bad apples in the barrel, I believe there is risk in the area of influencers. Now, uh, I said that <laughs> too. By the way, a long time ago when I did a show on um, digital influencers, but what did I say? I said uh, so. If you, uh, it's great if they have natural influence. If they start to buy influence and that kind of thing, then exactly the thing that you're trying to buy and trying to get there, you're, you're corrupting your own thing going on there. And you got to be really careful with some of these influencers too, because they could say something stupid. They could, they could really step in it. And when they step in it, you just stepped in it. Right. And it's really important to know that it's really, it's really, really, you know, key to, uh, to dealing with influencers. I love influencer marketing. It's not new. Everybody says, oh, it's new. It's a new thing. The public bull, bull. You know, the influencer marketing has been around since the 1940s. You know, it's like, it's, it's not new in any, in any capacity. You know, obviously, you know, reaching out to folks that have influence, influential channels on YouTube, that's just the latest platform that you reach out to people. But 
reaching out to influencers is something that public relations has done for a long, long time. Some of the influencers were analysts. Some of the influencers were, um, you know, media folks who pundits who knew a lot in the industry. Some of them were just, you know, columnists and, you know, and, and, and and people like that. Um, but it's, uh, you know, influencer marketing is, is going to come to a crossroads. And when you, when you see people like, Unilever saying we're not going to work with digital media influencers who buy followers, then it's going to kind of give permission to other people not to engage in that same behavior. And it's going to send a message to the digital influencers. This is a no, no, this is, you know, this is a no, no. And, um, you know, I'm going to do a show, you know, coming up about the kind of changing nature of digital marketing. But the, um, as I, as I said on my GDPR show, do you sense that the party is over? in all the things that marketing has been doing with people's data related to their privacy. I got another story in a, in a few minutes that can, that can illustrate that. But if you don't see that the party is coming to an end with this invasive, unethical uh, stuff that marketing's doing, <clears throat> you need to get the memo because this train is coming. It's absolutely coming. You heard it here first. I'm just saying. And on that subject, the Supreme Court today said that a warrant is necessary for phone location data in a win for privacy. So the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in favor of digital privacy today in a 5-4 decision. Justices said police need warrants to gather phone location data as evidence for trials. Now, this is for law enforcement and public safety and the police department. Do you honestly think that uh, you're going to be able to use phone location data to serve someone advertising? Let me ask you a better question. Do you think you should? Do you think it's ethical? Do you think, you know, would you like it if it happened to you or your kid? That kind of thing. If it's creepy to you, it's freaking creepy. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. I don't advocate my clients ever do that. When I find out they do, I shut it down yesterday. It's like it's going to come back and boomerang you in the butt, and you're going to need one of these attorneys to figure things out for you, and then you're going to need somebody like me to manage your reputation because you did a lot of stupid stuff for a good long time. Not cool, right? Very much not cool. So um, the best way to not do this is to not do it. And and I'm a huge advocate of that, uh, of that strategy. So more to come on uh, phone location data and that kind of stuff. But don't use that stuff. You can do better. Do better, do better. Come on back. We're going to do better. We're going to talk about how we can influence public opinion a bit, where we can shape it. Talk in a few. Hi, I'm Tim Dolbear, the host of Sound Experience on Intertalk Radio. Each week, I talk with top professional audio engineers, producers, musicians, and the manufacturers that make the tools that we use in the studio each and every day. From capturing the perfect take to mastering your final release and the tools and how the pros use them, we are going to dive deep into their process and learn from their experience. I look forward to you joining us each week on Sound Experience with me, your host, Tim Dolbear. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio, to sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. Make this your vinyl night. I'm John J.R. Robinson, and every week, music creation comes alive through stories, experiences, and sounds when vinyl records filled our hearts and minds. My friends and I share our tips and techniques used in creation of iconic tracks for recording artists such as Michael Jackson, Eric Clapton, Quincy Jones, and Steve Winwood, to name a few. Vinyl has emerged hot, and the soul of vinyl defines art and passion, which burns deepest at night. Tune in every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on entertalkradio.com. This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Groove. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al DiMiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. 
You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com. Ready to get your groove on? May the best brand win with Scott Robertson's Music Biz Marketing Strategies. Now, here's your host, Scott Robertson. Hey, hey, happy Friday, everybody. How smart are you? You are super smart because you are tuned to May the Best Brand Win on Intertalk Media, the undisputed leader in music biz talk. I am Scott. We've been talking about who's winning and losing. Paul's with me. What do you got, Paul? What do you like? Uh, I got to check out the Instagram TV thing. We do a lot of uh, live video streaming around here. And, yeah. Uh, th- this is definitely cool. uh, up our alley. Need to look into that. Looks cool so far. Looks, uh, looks cool so far. And uh, like I said, I think the trick will be, you know, how do you how do you do it and not, you know, be and not be the, the thing that's driving people away from the social network? <laughs> right. How do you how do you not be the thing, you know, uh, exactly. So it'll be it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting. Yeah. Happening. When Facebook Live came out, they really opened up the, you know, the, the pipeline to everything like just anything you put out on Facebook Live, they would just pump it out to thousands of people easily and then after a few months down yeah. the, down the line they're really dialing it dialing it back yeah you know i'm not a big fan of um of a lot of promoted posts and social media i just don't think that people want them and i just don't think that uh <clears throat> you know i just don't think that they're necessary if you have a really good story if you have a good message um you can you can push it now some would argue i would say on facebook you know do they cut back your reach of your organic followers and do they give you back that reach if you buy your way in that's what it seems yeah. like now yeah but, that's but it's true hard, but it's hard that's to say true. because in the first place they maybe gave you more reach than you deserve necessarily and you kind of get used to it and so i don't know but but it definitely seems like it uh, like it now now that they dialed it back and uh you know if you th- you throw a couple of bucks at it to boost it it'll get you back up to those numbers so it does seem like they kind of cut it cut it back so they could charge you for it now Oh yeah, that's a, that's absolutely what they did, and of course, then they have to walk the line too because they're selling an audience, right? But if the mm-hmm. audience goes, "Oh, there's too much marketing. This sucks," but they're the, out. But it's tricky go. too because at the same time, uh, you can't you can't boost a live video until after it airs. You could do it, you know, afterwards as, yeah, as an archive true. video. So it kind of you know you don't get that reach on live anymore, and you can't really even buy it anymore. So it's it's kind of a goofy setup. We'll we'll see what Instagram it, has to offer. Yeah, check out Instagram, uh, IGTV. I think it should be uh, it should be pretty fascinating. So for sure. Well, well, cool. That's who's winning and losing this week. We uh, we covered that. Now we're going to dig into segment three, and I call this uh, tips to help uh, shape public opinion your way. Uh, just like Burger King, have it your way. By the way, I should have covered this, but you know, you know, Burger King's been in the news quite a bit for having um, rats in their hamburger buns, and you just can't unsee the rat. Um, walking, you know, casually walking through a sealed bag of burger buns. Um, I got to say, I can't unsee that. That that's with me now, and um, I can't imagine. I can't imagine eating there again. I got to say, just just after after seeing that, maybe a few years from now, I, I will have forgotten that I've seen that. But they gotta they gotta find some way to deal with that. And the way to deal with that, by the way, is not a marketing solution. That's a why do we have a live rat? walking around our hamburger buns operational solution you know it's time you know because sometimes that'll come to me and and people like me and they'll say well scott what do we do about this i would say my first thing would be back uh, why is the rat there what what happened what the hell and then the answer to what the hell is the is what you need to um fix you know fix and correct and then you have a communications uh piece to it that says we've we found out how skippy the rat got in there and and now we've um we figured it out but anyway these are tips to uh i digress off of that the burger king was losing by the way to that that video is horrible but uh tips to uh, shape public opinion your way number one numero uno be consistent with your messaging um if you want you know the to help the public kind of see it your way uh make sure that you don't you know, flip flop and, um, you know, on your, you know, your position on things, 
and don't, and don't be vague about it. You know, be be very consistent with your message. I see people violate this all the time, and sometimes people are saying, uh, you know, they, they come out and they'll say they'll say one thing, and then oh well, it looks like a, a large you know or, or a, a small group of people disagree with us, so now we're going to change our messaging so that we don't offend anybody. Uh, you know, depending on the issue, you know, um, it, you know, it's man, people are just looking to be offended in the world, right? So how does a company go through, if your goal is we're going to be completely non-offensive, we're not going to offend anybody wherever, A, you're dreaming. <laughs> B, uh, that's, you're not going to be very interesting. I mean, how can you say anything interesting and not, and not have an opinion. You know, now I'm not saying go out on a limb and have an opinion on things that don't concern your brand. Um, we've discussed that and how dumb that is, you know, in a, in a lot of ways, but, um, you know, you're going to offend somebody is, is a good way to say it. And if they're, if, if public opinion, you know, the, the, the best way to shape public opinion and don't forget, we're not talking about, you know, like we said in the first segment, it's not like there's a, a huge majority of people on every issue and it's, and it's unchanged and they feel this way. And, and so we kind of know this. It's like this is very nuanced and shaded. So you've got, um, you know, if you're, when we're talking about the, the public, we kind of, again, if we want to substitute audience in there. So we're saying our audience, let's say we've got males, you know, 18 to 40, you know, who buy guitars. And, you know, we want to, sh- you know, we find out that the public opinion is that they, let's say they prefer vintage. They prefer vintage guitars and we kind of, we kind of know that. But we want to change that opinion, you know, gradually. Something like that's always going to be gradual. You know, what, what would we need to do? We would need to be consistent about, with our message and talk about all the reasons why you know, and basically show people the other side without without necessarily going forward and offending them. But in this world that's sort of hyper offended by everything, you know, there there are certainly uh, risk that people might be offended with what you have to say. And you got to be strong enough to say, look, we're consistent in our messaging. You know, we're backing up our brand values. We have all that stuff kind of kind of lined up. I mean, that's what communications people do is 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 uh, make sure that stuff is lined up the right way. Number two. Tip number two, be credible. Uh, if you're going to try to have, if you're going to try to, you know, change your audience's mind about a given issue, um, you need to have the credibility that goes along with it. And if you're going to try to build your credibility by getting like, now let's just say influencers, you know, let's say you wanted to get analysts, media, stakeholders, you know, people in, in a particular industry kind of all feeling the same way, which can be a very good gradual public relations, uh, you know, uh, you know, strategy, you know, to, uh, to win those people over. You got to make sure that you yourself as an organization are credible. And then you have to make sure that the people that you, uh, that you bring into this thing, you got to make sure that they are, uh, are credible as well. And again, you know, when you're bringing in influencers on things, you know, you, you also have to weigh the pluses and minuses of getting different folks, you know, involved and, and being a, a crusader for your cause. Like, uh, you know, Howard Stern's a very um, polarizing figure, you know, uh, and you never know what he's going to say on his radio show <clears throat> in trouble all the time because he's got, you know, um, he's Howard Stern. There you go. If your credibility is hinged on his, you know, and that kind of thing, you know, you may want to, may want to be careful with that. Right. I would, I would say, you know, it would depend on the assignment for something like that, but credibility, very, very important in shaping uh, public opinion. And so <clears throat> you have to show people why you're credible and, uh, and reinforce that. Number three, you want to be well researched. You want to know the facts um, in fact, it, you know, if, um, let's, let's just do our vintage versus new gear kind of thing, right? Cause it is kind of fascinating. I mean, you find, um, you, you heard Henry Jessica was talking about it, you know, a, a couple of months ago, 
where he basically kind of insulted the whole audience and said, "What well, they're stupid and they should have, and they, what they should have is they should have um, the better, um, you know, the, the most technological guitars that we produce with auto tuning and and um, you know uh, robotic tuners and and uh, you know all all the latest technology, but instead they want like you know a sixty eight, you know that kind of thing, and it's like." You know what? What's another? What's another rule? Right? We don't. You don't ever tell the audience that they're dumb, uh, because they will leave. And then what? Then what do you got? But you want to be well, well researched on something like that. If you're going to try to, if you're going to try to change people's mind and explain to them why new gear is better than vintage, you know, music gear, then you need to have some facts, right? Facts can help persuade people. You can say, uh, you know, I mean, all kinds of things. You know, um, you could say the, the capabilities of new gear far exceed um, old gear's capabilities. You know, some some new some guitars. You know, have uh, w- one client of mine was a uh, Fusion Guitars, and they have an I, an iPhone dock right in the guitar. You know, I, I love me a nice vintage Gibson, but you know, there is no lightning port in that guitar. You know, so so and and that opens up a you know an entire like you know valley of new stuff that you can do um, in terms of uh, the guitar. I mean, the cool thing about the fusion guitar to me is the fact that it can sound like any guitar. It can have any kind of you know amp. You can run you know these apps, you know mobile apps through it that can do almost anything to the sound. You can record directly into one of the apps. You know without a cable without doing, you know, pretty much anything. You can have the thing on the go with this incredible rig that you have on your, on your smartphone. I mean, it's really, uh, there really are a lot of reasons, but you want to be well-researched on that. You don't want to just go in and go, ah, the audience is stupid. They don't know. Here's what they should have. And I know it because I just know, you know, be well-researched, know your facts. That's when you show up and you can start to change people's minds. You don't change anyone's mind by uh you know insulting them and and not giving reasons why they should they should change their mind very important so tip number 4 you know be transparent you know don't um if if you have a position let's just keep going with our vintage you know if you have a position on vintage versus new then be transparent about that position you know wh- whatever that you know uh, position is going to be don't um you know don't be wishy-washy about it is a good way to say that. You know, make sure that you're not, uh, you know, changing, you know, not, not necessarily changing your position, but just be clear about, you know, who you are, why you are that way, you know, what those, those reasons are, and, and then make sure that you don't um, try to hide, you know, who you are in a given issue. You know, especially because, you know, people, the media love to bust companies that uh that changed their position i mean starbucks i mean do, do we even have do we even have to talk about starbucks and how non-transparent they are and have been about their issue about race i mean it goes all the way back to they um you know uh an- announced i guess a few years ago a uh, a campaign where they said um well we're gonna have all of our baristas you know have have a Engage in an open and honest conversation about race, you know, to our custom with our customers. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard in my life. For and nobody wants to have a conversation about race when they're trying to get their coffee, right? And and nobody wants to have a conversation with your barista about race. That's stupid. And that's a conversation that you want to have with your friends and people whose opinion you trust. I don't know a barista, and I could care less what they think. You know, I mean, that's the dumbest idea I ever heard in my entire life. Um, and instead of, and by the way, instead of saying this, they went forward with it and then they ended up having to, um, uh, retract on it. And the director of communications for Starbucks had to delete his entire Twitter account because it lit up with people with negative. And, and that's what I mean by, by, by when we talk about being transparent, if you made a mistake like that, and believe me, that is a mistake, you know, don't delete your Twitter account, you know, don't, don't, you know, uh, that's, that's just that's bad. Don't, don't delete your Twitter account. Don't delete the tweets. There are tons of people who have screenshots of what you said. Um, you're not deleting anything. And if you delete it, then you just look guilty. Then you just look like, Oh, well you guys must have something to hide. And 
the whole reason we do marketing is about trust, credibility, respect. If you're going to engage in behaviors like that, you're undoing everything the rest of the company is trying to do. Everything the rest of the company is trying to do gets undone by stuff like that. So, um, so don't do it. You know, be, you know, have the courage to be transparent about things. If you feel, if you're, if your CEO of your company feels a certain way about a certain issue, have the courage to stand up and say it, you know, I, again, if it is your issue and it's the issue that you're working on and, and that kind of thing, I would, again, I wouldn't recommend going on a limb and commenting on, you know, celebrity couples and, and stupid things like that. I mean, you know, and it, it's probably not your business and it's not going to help you, you know, always got to ask what's in it for us too, as a brand number tip, number five on shaping public opinion. Again, be strong. Don't cater to any vocal minority on things. And, don't, and as we talked about consistency, right? You're not going to flip flop on anything, but it's important to be strong. If you want people to gradually start to change their minds about an issue, you must have strength in how you talk about the issue. You must have passion. You, you know, you must have these things. It is very, very important. Um, if you really wanted to convince a lot of, vent, you know, and, and by the way, this is where we kind of talk about the bell curve of, of people. You're not going to, if you're going to try to convince um, guitar players that, that new guitars are better than vintage guitars, there is a percentage on the bell curve of vintage guitar loving dudes who, you know, they're playing their CCR and their ACDC baby, and you ain't going to convince them a jack nothing. You ain't going to do it. So, so don't try, right? Don't, don't, you know, go after the, the people that you can convince people who, who will hold that opinion, but maybe they could, they could see your side as well. It's important. Be strong, be strong, be strong. That's my, those are my tips on how to uh, shape public opinion your way. So, you know, what did we learn today? You know, we learned that public opinion is super important to organizations and businesses out there and really being able to analyze, interpret, and influence it is how our profession earns its place at the table, right? It's one of the most important things that we do in this very tactical world of marketing today. And it is tactical. People are thinking about how they can communicate before they even know what they want to say. It pays to have professionals out there who are still concerned with public opinion and designing strategies to help various audiences, you know, kind of see things our way. It is long-term work. It is not easy. But, you know, that's why they have us, right? That's it for me, folks. Until July, because of Summer Nam next week, uh, this has been Scott Robertson, host of Made the Best Brand Win on Intertalk Media. Rock on. We will see you again soon. Later. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on Intertalk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. Hi, this is Tim Dolbear from Eclectica Studios. I'm a full-time mixing and recording engineer. I work with Grammy winners, labels, and indie artists using state-of-the-art digital mixing and restoration tools and the very best in analog gear. Really, though, it's my ability to bring tracks to life and fulfill your vision for your music. This has made me sought after by producers and artists worldwide. So spend your time working on music and not chasing a mix down a rabbit hole. Go to timdolbear.com and check out our free one-song mix offer. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. 
This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Groove. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al Dimiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie's Groove.com. Ready to get your groove on? Mm-hmm. 